I'm an orthodontist. Um, I do braces, but what I my passion is working with children with cleft lip and palate from birth through their uh, growing years uh, until they uh, finish growing. Um, I've been working with Dr. Hobar for 31 years um, on leap trips, um, and we worked together very closely in Dallas um, years ago as well. A little bit about me, I uh, work with a cleft team in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, I teach at the University of Minnesota, uh, trying to um, prepare our orthodontic residents for managing cleft lip and palate in their practices. And I also have a, a small private practice in my hometown of St. Croix Falls, Wisconsin. And so what we're going to be talking about today is how we achieve this, which you really can't tell there's a cleft there, I hope, and how, how we go from there to there in a very short period of time, uh, about three months. And basically, some assembly is required. That is what happens initially. The pieces are there, they're just not in the right place. So we're going to be working to do that um, through some uh, orthopedics and some soft tissue management, and then of course, the lip surgery that uh, we like to have occur around three to four months of age. So a parent, when they're expecting a child, expects a beautiful baby, that, um, a Gerber baby. Do you guys know what that means, Gerber baby? I was hoping you did. And, and those dreams are dashed when this child is born. Now in the U.S., most of these are diagnosed before birth at this point. I don't, does that happen here, uh, ultrasounds? Yeah. So that's hard. Um, it used to be that way for us um, years ago too, but now we have the ability to um, counsel and um, educate the families before birth, which is very helpful. So when, when these um, children are born, especially if it's um, the diagnosis is at birth, um, there's shock and grief and um, it's, it's really hard for these families. And their dreams, these dreams of the Gerber baby have been dashed. So there's questions, how will this child eat? And you know, that's very basic and maternal. Um, how, how are we going to help this child survive? Uh, will they be able to talk? Will he date? And will he marry and have children of his own? Those are all questions. And as providers that are interacting with these families initially, it's really important that we give them the support and the compassion and the um, education they need in order to um, accept, move on from the grief and the mourning that they're experiencing um, to providing excellent care for their, their children. So I wanted to take a few minutes um, to talk about um, treatment philosophy, how we can go about uh, helping these families. So there, there's a challenge. There, we have a, a child with a cleft we can either see this as a problem or an opportunity. Now, um, it takes a while to process all that, but um, as an opportunity, there can be blessings in that. Um, as, as a problem, there's limitations. Um, and we wanna inspire each of our children to be the best of what they can be. Um, and that's our goal. I'd love to spend a few minutes just interacting and knowing more about the perception um, socially of a cleft, of the a child born with a cleft in, in your communities. How is that perceived? Um, in the US, it's, um, it's something that is fixable and we, we have a plan and, and we go. Um, in other countries, what we experience is that um, the family is um, shunned, isolated, they're seen as, uh, the child is seen as an outcast. The family may be treated as though they um, are blamed for some past um, sin or um, curse. Um, but I'm just curious to know uh, where, where the community stands in this. Any, any thoughts on that? It just helps us prepare with Mary's gift well, in my village, I'm from the south of Belize. We had one person uh, that was born that way, but basically the community helped the family. Wonderful. For the child. Uh-huh. Right. 
Mayan? Does it matter if it's Mayan or Amish? No, because or... The, the, the belief or the discrimination might be due to the culture, but over the belief we have different cultures. Right. right. So it's kind of uh, depends on, 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 on the culture and your family. Of, of the family, the theater, the, that's what happens now. But my experience for people, like you said, they might be outcast and probably they not show up, maybe one reason why they don't come back to uh, from far off. Because they basically go in hiding with the child and nobody knows them again. Interesting. Yeah. Well, with Mary's gift, our, our goal is to to provide the education and the encouragement for each of these families to know that it is not a curse, um, that uh, we hope that there's not isolation. We want to just uh, provide the compassion and the support that they need to uh, just move on and, uh, and uh, help their child grow to be um, the best that they can be. So I just wanted to share. So when we have them at the time of deliverance, we work in maternity. You know? uh -huh. Because sometimes you hear it by radio, by Facebook, you know, that you guys are coming. Sometimes we don't know when you guys are coming. Right. So, but we do tell them that there is hope when, you know, for their Wonderful. specific malformation. But we have others that we don't sure. have a program for. Uh -huh. So I guess in that sense, at the ward, we give them this, this hope that there is how to fix this problem. Right. You Wonderful. Know, I see the challenge we're having is that they're coming back, you know. Maybe it's like what Doc says, you know, I don't show my child out on the street, you know, because mm -hmm. you don't want to be judged. Yeah. But um, mm -hmm. I guess at the ward, I think we have to be a little bit more sensible when it comes to showing them what can be done. You know, Very good. Yes. So, you're right. So I'm, I'm just going to share with you um, some, um, some blessings that have come through uh, the challenges of, uh, of a child with a cleft um, that most of them Dr. Hober and I worked on together years ago. Um, this is Cami. This is uh, somebody that Dr. Hobar um, just did amazing work with. Um, she is now married. She had a severe bilateral cleft of the lip and palate. She was um, adopted by missionaries in Guatemala from a coffee farm family who could not take care of her. Um, and she's gone on to be an amazing uh, Christian singer with uh, three beautiful children. She's uh, very happily married. This is Brian. Um, Brian was a semi-professional minor league baseball player and an opera singer um, with a unilateral cleft. Um, and he married recently. And do you have a picture of this, Craig? Do you have that picture? The family sent it to me. Um, and is absolutely adored by his wife. Um, Brian went through many surgeries as well um, and has gone on to be very successful. This is Hannah. Um, Hannah was born with a unilateral cleft lip and palate, um, as was her mother. Um, and she's gone, she's a nurse, if I recall. And she was in Haiti, I believe, when um, she was able to really minister to, and just comfort a mother as their child was going into surgeries that look, look at me, I, I had the same thing. Um, so she was, she found that um, as, a, as a blessing. And Jennifer, um, Jennifer has a unilateral cleft lip and palate as well. And this was moments before she was crowned homecoming queen at a large uh, Dallas high school. And this is Robert who was very proud to bring this photo in of his hot prom date that he had. And so again, and we want to inspire children to, re to achieve their highest potential. That is our goal, is just to walk with these families. It is a journey. Um, it is a long journey uh, from birth till, till growth is complete. So very briefly, um, we're just going to be talking today from birth to three, but just to, to give you an idea of the orthodontic timeline, it's birth to the first surgery, um, and we'll be spending that time today talking about that. Then, ideally, around eight years of age, we're starting to prepare for the alveolar bone graft, which is putting bone into the gum area so that orthodontics can be
completed later um, and grow that occurs throughout um, growth. When a child is born with a, a cleft lip and palate, uh, there's four options. One is no treatment um, and just monitor. Um, hopefully weight is monitored along the way and, and as well as feeding. There's passive obturation, which is just putting some sort of barrier in over the palate um, that keeps the lip down or the tongue down and um, can help with feeding. There's also passive operation. Something's in the mouth and then tape is placed to start working on bringing those soft tissues, those um, pieces of the lip segments together and starting to shape the nose and then active orthopedics. And that's where we're acti actually trying to make the cleft smaller bringing everything back to where it should be so that the surgeon can do ab the absolute best job possible at the time of the lip surgery. So with the monitoring only, it's very simple. There's no cost, there's no care, um, and uh, it's nothing's done until the time of the surgery. The disadvantages are that tongue then sits up in the cleft area. Oftentimes it can make the, the alveolar segment uh, gap larger, um, and it's not a great position for the tongue. It's harder um, with speech issues later, and uh, feeding can be compromised. Um, but obturation, if, if we're just going to cover the cleft uh, through those first few months before the surgery, it's just a small little plate that's made from a, a, dental, <laughs> from a dental impression. It's really not that funny. <laughs> from a small dental plate. It can help with feeding and getting that tongue into a better position uh, long term. Okay, and so with this, um, we can also have the family start taping. And with the taping, putting tape on the lip to bring the segments together, um, we can start to see some soft tissue changes, some stretching of those lip muscles, some changes in the nose. Uh, we're not we can see some change in the uh, position of the, the gum pieces, um, but we don't have a lot of control. So that is an option as well. And this, this is um, nasoalveolar molding, or NAM, um, and that's a very active orthopedic movement that we're trying to achieve to bring those gum pieces together, uh, work on the soft tissue, and uh, develop uh, take a severe cleft and make it mild prior to the surgery. And th these are just some examples of what that looks like with the device in and tape on the lip. So we believe, we believe strongly in the benefits of this act of orthopedics, and that's what we do in the States uh, on many of our cases. Um, it's, it helps with feeding to get to obturate that cleft. There's a, um, a piece that goes, that fully covers the uh, upper jaw and extends up into the nose, gets the tongue back down where it belongs. Um, we find dramatic changes, as I will show you, in the lip, the nose, and the alveolus, and hopefully eliminating the need for uh, more extensive surgeries later. And it allows the family to be actively working to make things um, better uh, it gives them hope, and uh, and with the tape on and the the appliance in, maybe easy easier for them to socialize, to to bring their baby to the grocery store, or to church, uh, and uh, so. The appliance, sorry, the appliance you guys make the. Yes, we do. Any dentist can make it. No, it, it, yeah, no, but we we hope at some point to be able to teach somebody here to do that. Absolutely, that is one of our goals. The disadvantages, it, um, it requires a lot of care. The family takes the appliance in and out of the mouth twice a day and cleans it and makes sure that um, everything is, um, there's no sore spots or that it's staying in well. Um, and in the U.S., it, it, there's an expense with that. Um, and there, if we're actively moving the segments, there's, um, we want to see the, the family weekly to make those changes. And there's a possible um, sore spot on the appliance or uh, trauma to the lip from the tape. 
So just to give you an image of what the skull, what the, the hard tissues look like uh, with a unilateral cleft, we see that there, there's bone that, that's um, not in the right place. We see that the nasal septum there is deviated. Um, there's not a base for the nose on that side. So it, it's, um, it's a significant uh, condition that, that requires a lot of attention as we've talked about earlier. So soft tissue wise, what, look, we're just gonna be naming a few things here. Um, alar dome, alar base, and columella. We're gonna be talking about all those things. And what we see here is a deviated septum. There's lack of symmetry to the nose, to the cartilages in the nose that we wanna try and correct prior to that surgery. Now we know that for the few first six weeks or so of life, uh, these cartilages are very malleable. We can change, permanently change the shape to something that is much more symmetric. And that, that again is our goal. So a little anatomy here. We see the deviation of the septum in that area. We also see a feeding ulcer right there. That's from the friction of the, the nipple of the bottle rubbing against that soft tissue. And then we see the large alveolar gap. The alar dome is very skewed. Columella is displaced. So we're gonna be working on all those. And just a schematic here of what what the uh, alar cartilage is looking like um, and the changes that we want to make in it to make to create more symmetry. So here is at birth on the left and right before surgery on the right. We've worked to develop a columella, create the alar dome that's required to create that symmetry and bring those gum pieces together making it much easier for the surgeon to just um, do a great job. They always do anyway, but uh, we can make it uh, easier and more successful. So there's many different um, combinations as far as the position of the alveolar segments at birth. Now, what we want to achieve in our work is the narrow no collapse. Often we see wide no collapse, and so we're going to be working on trying to bring those segments together to give the nose a nice base uh, for moving forward. Narrow no collapse, in that case, we're taking that smaller segment and bringing it out to create that U shape. And then wide collapse, and that is what we're, oh, that was what we were seeing on that last slide. So here's that at birth, uh, right before surgery and after surgery. So we're planning on reducing the severity of the cleft, reducing surgical interventions later, normalizing for social interaction, and decreasing cost and burden due to uh, less surgeries. So this, at this point in time, requires uh, an impression of the upper uh, jaw. Now there are some new studies coming out in the US where we're actually doing a scan, a digital scan of the upper jaw and then printing the model. We're not quite at that point yet um, in our facility, but we're still using an impression to uh, obtain the, the cast that allows us to create the, um, the appliance, the device. So we've taken the impression, we've created the, the model and then from that, we're making almost a mini denture without teeth on it that's held in with a denture adhesive uh, and that's worn pretty much all the time. Babies don't like it out. They want it back in once it's taken out. And it can have various different shapes. Um, and uh, here we is very typical. We have a, a wire that goes into the alar dome as a nasal extension um, bilateral. Um, many different um, variations. And there's some supplies that are used along with that. Are you using these with a patient? No, 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 no. But we want to. <laughs> That's Mary's gift school. Yeah, we're working towards that goal. Yep. And we're, we're here to help. Um, if we find the person that can do this, uh, we are happy to give them the, 
the training and the education they need and the supplies. So here we have a schematic and basically what we do is um, they come in weekly and to this area here on that device I'm adding some soft acrylic, some denture beeline material. Um, and then in this area here in the appliance I'm removing so we've created a force and a place for that segment to begin moving. Here we're just removing uh, some of the acrylic so that this area can continue to grow. And again, we're doing this weekly, uh, typically. And basically, we're just bending the bone. We're just taking the, this part here and just bending it around so that it meets with the lesser segment. Sometimes there's a little, a little tooth, a little extra tissue there. Usually it just falls off during the treatment time. Uh, so we go from here to here prior to surgery, at birth, and right before surgery. And birth, before surgery, and after surgery. And again, some more examples. So here is um, just a, uh, the models that were obtained. That's at birth, pretty wide cleft here, and really uh, have an issue with the position of that greater segment. We're bending the bone around. This is um, at the time of the surgery. Now, this was taken a month after the surgery, and we can see how it's closed even more. And that's because the lip, once it's closed, is very powerful and will continue to work to bring those segments together. So in active orthopedics, um, this, if you're reading the literature, uh, a lot of the uh, literature comes from a, a uh, treatment that uses more of a sling of uh, for retention, doesn't use the denture adhesive. Um, and so there's uh, much more involved as far as the taping. And our system uses just the, the denture adhesive for the retention um, and a smaller piece of tape. But our, our goal in a unilateral cleft is that conversational distance, you should not be able to tell that there's a cleft. That is our goal. In a very wide cleft, uh, if the cleft is, is very wide and the, the formal chyloplasty is not an option, then a lip adhesion procedure is, is um, performed, which um, takes some of the lip uh, muscles and brings them together. And that, again, that powerful lip will start bringing those gum pieces together so that the surgeon can come in later and do the formal chyloplasty. But I want you to look at that, the nasal cartilage there. That's, that's hard to uh, really re to, um, create symmetry um, without that early intervention. In the bilateral, here we see that there's three, th one, two, three gum pieces. This part, which is going to hold the incisors, um, is suspended off of the uh, nasal septum. So it's very mobile. It's often outside of the mouth, uh, but again, very little support to the nose there. So here we see the anterior segment here. This is the part, again, that's going to have the uh, front teeth, three pieces of lip, and then um, the alar domes here. So we brought this anterior segment back into the mouth, stretched this prolabium, and created a columella. And this is what the device looks like. It has forces here to straighten out the deviated septum. We're adding acrylic to this area here, back and pushing up on the alar dome. So here, when we see these patients weekly, I'm adding more material here to create the force to bring this anterior segment back. Our goal is to create just a, a nice U shape here um, and then removing in these areas here, also allowing these posterior segments to continue to grow. <clears throat> so some more uh, photographs here. Initial, we see this anterior segment is displaced to one side, very little columella, and the prolabium is um, displaced as well. And this is the child right before surgery. We've created that columella. 
we brought the uh, anterior segment back in and centered it and created um, a situation where we've got some nice curve to the, the uh, alar domes. And a, a severe, very severe bilateral uh, cleft where this, this part of the lip is uh, parallel to the floor, anterior segment is outside of the mouth, uh, and we've brought that anterior segment back. We've created the columella and created a vertical position to that prolabium. Example here, uh, we've gotten some columella development there, uh, and here he is after his surgery. And here's the models of, of uh, bringing the anterior segment and centering it. So we've done here, and then bringing it back so that the alveolar ridge lines up nicely. And this is prior to the surgery. So we have a, a bilateral cleft lip and palate here. We've worked with creating that columella development, bringing the prolabium back. Um, we've worked on really stretching that columella. And this is what it looks like in, we have the device in the mouth. Then um, there's one piece of tape that goes from the prolabium down onto the appliance. So that's pulling down as these uh, alar uh, extensions are pushing up. So basically this is a little tissue expander is basically what it is. And then there's another piece of tape that goes from the one side to the middle and then from the other side to the middle, um, stretching those tissues, those very soft, malleable tissues. Um, and here he is after surgery. Okay, so in summary, in, uh, with pre-surgical orthopedics, we, our advantage is that we can get things back where they belong. That assembly required, um, we start that process. We believe there's less reconstructive surgeries later with a better outcome. We can lengthen that columella without having to do that surgically later. Uh, feeding uh, it becomes much more efficient once there's a device in the mouth. Um, parents come back after that first week and just are pretty much always uh, just very excited about how much more efficient and effective feeding um, is. And then coping benefits for the family. The fact that they're doing something um, to actively um, see the changes is very helpful. So then we take a break. You know, we've worked very intensely for the, those first three to four months. Um, we're usually not seeing the child back in orthodontics till they're about three to once all the primary dentition is in place. Um, but there's many dental issues that are associated with cleft lip and palate. Um, there's often congenitally missing teeth, especially lateral incisors in the cleft area. Sometimes there's extra teeth, uh, especially primary teeth um, in the cleft region. Um, you saw a ne neonatal tooth um, on one of those slides. Uh, the teeth around the cleft area often have uh, morphology issues as far as um, pits in the enamel, um, root structure may not be um, as uh, robust as the other teeth. Uh, and of course the teeth are in the, um, near the cleft can have little bone support or periodontal uh, support. Also because of the surgeries that we perform, there's scar tissue that doesn't allow for uh, full growth potential of the maxilla. So there's off, often maxillary hypoplasia. So, and that's what we're seeing here. Uh, we see an anterior crossbite where the top teeth are inside the bottom ones. They should be on the outside. We see that there's um, a lateral incisor that's turned here. We also see an extra one way up in the cleft area. So there's, there's issues um, that will begin uh, being addressed um, once a primary dentition has, um, is in place. So we're just uh, managing, monitoring. Now, speech becomes a very important part at this point. Um, and then just assessing um, soft tissue response. Um, the message that I would love to leave with you um, as far as primary dentition is um, counseling and um, educating the families in not 
taking a bottle to bed with anything other than water. So nursing bottle carries is a, is a big issue. And this is from um, milk or something else um, being given to the baby at night while they're sleeping. So um, encouraging families to use only water if a bottle goes to bed with them uh, can resolve a lot of issues. So I wanna leave you with, I don't care how much you know until I know how much you care. And compassion is so important in this journey um, that these families go through. Um, they, they need that support, that social support. What questions are there? What comments? So it's our goal to bring these services um, through Mary's gift to, uh, to Belize. <laughs>